Strategy is a system of operation, a system, a way of doing things. When Jesus told Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, he said, I'm going to show you the strategy, the system by which heaven operates. We're going to talk about that today. Arkansas Alive starts right now. When Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded and said, upon this revelation of who I am, I'm going to build my church and I'm going to give you the system of heaven. I'm going to give you the keys, the operating system of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the earthly sphere of the kingdom of God. You could say we have dual citizenship. We're citizens of heaven, but we live in this earth. And the way we're supposed to live in the earth is by heaven's system of operation. So as we teach understanding the kingdom of heaven, it's imperative that we know these things and that'll take all the confusion and the stress out of living in the earth, operating according to the kingdom of heaven. Now, yesterday I mentioned to you about strategy. Strategy is not just getting from point A to point B. Strategy is what do you hope to accomplish by getting from point A to point B? And I referenced the time that I spent at the U.S. Army War College studying the Battle of Gettysburg. The South hoped to accomplish a psychological impact on the North by winning the Battle of Gettysburg. But what they failed in was their communication. They sent out a scout, but he got drunk and was delayed a few days, comes back. He didn't even know that the North had changed commanders. They refortified new troops, everything. So when, when the uh, South went across that field, and it's still the same way it was back in the 1860s, they were just mowed down by the North because they didn't have proper communication. Today, our military has great communication. Communication is an art. It's necessary if you're going to uh, cast a vision. Corporations are really keen on this. Corporations use systems. And we as the church need to realize that Jesus has given us the system by which heaven operates, and it's our responsibility to use it. I, I want to go to John chapter 18, verse 36, in following this train of thought. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, this world system, if my kingdom were of this world system, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. You know, they, they, the disciples were always asking Jesus, uh, when are you going to uh, bring Jerusalem? When are you going to bring uh, in your kingdom? When are you going to establish the kingdom? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus said, I, I operate a spiritual kingdom. Um, the kingdom of heaven is within you. <laughs> Uh, scripture references the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is not with observation. He said, when somebody comes and tells you, oh, the kingdom's over here, the kingdom's over there. He said, don't believe it. He said, the kingdom of God is not with observation. The kingdom of God is within you. Now, <clears throat> as, as Christians, uh, let me give you scripture on this. We're going to go over to Colossians chapter 1 verses 12 and 13, but when I say it, we'll go over there. As Christians, we have switched kingdoms, but we have failed to switch systems. Let me say that again. As Christians, we have switched kingdoms. The Bible says we've been, we've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of light. Most every Christian would agree with that. Yes, amen, hallelujah. I'm no more of the devil. I'm no more of darkness. 
I'm of Jesus. I'm of the, I'm of the light. I'm, I'm the light of the world. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. He was the light of the world. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. We, we all agree with that, but what we fail to do as believers is we have not changed systems. Go with me over to Colossians chapter 1 uh, and verse uh, 12 and 13. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, how did he make us fit? We had to be born again. When you get born again, you get born into the kingdom of God's dear son. So he made you in his image and likeness. You're a spirit being. He gives you the new birth, the opportunity to be born again. You renew your mind with the word of God. This is, this is tantamount. You have to renew your mind. If you don't renew your mind, <clears throat> you can never operate according to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to switch around here. I'm going to flip around and go over to Romans chapter 12. And let's look at verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, this world system, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, your mind doesn't get born again. Your spirit does. You are spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body. Your soul includes your mind, your will, your intellect, the seat of your desires. Your, your, your mind has to be renewed with the word of God. And while legally, spiritually, we've been born again, made fit to be in the kingdom of God, that means we qualify for what Jesus told Peter. I give you the keys of the kingdom. Start using the kingdom of heaven system. Start using the authority of my name. But you have to renew your mind to it because your mind's been renewed by the world. Your mind's been trained and taught by the world. Your mind's been trained by the secular medium of television. There's a flu season coming. There's a big headache out there waiting for you. For you know it, you're trained to think that way. <clears throat> you're trained to believe everything you see and read, not knowing the source, the spin. You, you, you know, the, 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 the weather forecaster that comes on and tells you, well, we're going to have storms and thunderstorms and hail and lightning and winds and blah, blah, blah. Now they're, they're doing the best they can with the equipment that they have, but we tend to pay more attention to that than we do the Bible. <laughs> the Bible gives us ways to detect the weather. Jesus said in the morning, uh, you see red skies uh, or in the evening, you see red skies Red, uh, in the Navy, they used to teach us red skies at night, sailors delight, smooth sailing. Red skies in the morning, sailor take warning. Jesus said you can discern the face of the sky by the, by the sunset and the sunrise, but you can't discern the signs of the times. Your mind has to be renewed with the Word of God. Besides that, no matter what the, the weather uh, does, you have authority given to you by God to use the name of Jesus to come against all perversions of nature. Tornadoes, hurricanes, hail, storms, damaging winds, those are perversions of nature. Those are not acts of God, even though your insurance company policy might say that. Those are perversions. When Jesus stood up in the boat and rebuked the winds, he spoke to the winds, he spoke to the sea and said, peace. Actually, what Jesus was saying Rick Renner, Greek scholar, he's on VTN from Moscow, Russia. Rick studied it out. And he said what Jesus was saying was, shh, be quiet. That's a calming effect, doesn't it? That's what mo mothers say to babies. Shh. Jesus was saying to the wind, to the waves, shh, peace, be still. 
Go back to the normal purpose for which you were created, which was not destruction. Remember the disciples? <laughs> they were afraid, fear for their li fearful of their lives. Woke Jesus up, said, Master, we're perishing here. We're dying here. They were afraid. And Jesus said, why are you afraid? Why don't you get this? Why don't you use your authority? Where is your faith? Now they're living in the earth. They're subject to storms and winds, destruction. And we're on the earth subject to the same things. And what does Jesus tell them? He says, why didn't you, I'm paraphrasing, why didn't you use the system or the strategy of heaven? Why didn't you speak to the wind and the waves? Well, I didn't know I could. Of course you can. You're born again. <laughs> you have the power uh, of the authority of the name of Jesus available to you. Uh, your mind has to be renewed to these things. If your mind is not renewed, you don't know the difference between the world system and the system of the kingdom of heaven. So he said, you renew your mind and you prove that which is good, perfect, and acceptable. Go back over to Colossians. Read the rest of it with me. Giving thanks unto the Father, which made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So we've been, we've been delivered from the power of darkness. We've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, my statement was as Christians, we've switched kingdoms. There's the scripture for it right there. There's Bible. But we have failed to switch systems. Oh, man, let me go. Let me go over to Mark eleven twenty three. 23. Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Now, here's an example of the system of the kingdom of heaven and how Jesus exercises his authority and how he tells his disciples to exercise their authority. Mark eleven twenty two. Now, you remember Jesus had just um, come back from ministering. He saw a fig tree. Uh, he, it was, the fig tree was lying and by its appearance. Jesus thought there were figs and there were no figs. So <clears throat> Jesus said to the fig tree, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. That's what he said. Who is Jesus? Well, of course, he's the son of God. But in the Bible, while he was on earth, he called himself the son of man, son of David. Only Peter recognized that he was the Christ in the beginning. Everybody else was not so sure. So they, they, they go in, they come back. <clears throat> He goes and throws the money changers out of the temple, comes back, and, and uh, Peter said, Lord, uh, remember the fig tree uh, which you cursed the other day? He said, look, it's withered up. It's died. And Jesus said, have the faith of God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. That is a kingdom of heaven system of operation. Speaking the word of God to an object or a person or a demon or a sickness or a disease. Jesus said, this is the way the kingdom of heaven Operates. We're talking about understanding the kingdom of heaven. How does the kingdom of heaven operate? I, I wrote a book years ago called The Word System. The Word System examines and illuminates this system of speaking creative words, creative power. As long as you're speaking the word of God, you're speaking creative power. So you renew your mind with the Word of God. You speak the Word of God to whatever situation you're in. And that's a kingdom of heaven system of operation. So we've switched kingdoms. 
We've been made fit for the kingdom of heaven. We've switched kingdoms, but we failed to switch systems. Uh, go with me to another scripture over to Second Peter and let's look at verse, well, let's see, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. <clears throat> According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So God has given us his divine power to use. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's everything. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, by these promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Now, I know that's scary to religious people uh, and to, to, to secular carnal people. Uh, it, it, it sounds strange to them because they haven't heard it, but there it is in the scriptures. There it is in the Bible. He's telling us that he, God has given us his divine nature. We are now the sons of God through our faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about uh, false doctrine or erroneous doctrine. It, it says in John, he has, the gospel of John, he has given us the power to become the sons of God. I'm not, I'm not talking about the manifestation of the sons of God, erroneous doctrine years ago. He has given us power to become the sons of God. We get born again, the new birth, through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary. Then we renew our mind with the word of God, find out what the word says. And then we exercise our authority that Jesus gave us and use his name. And we can talk to trees. We can talk to fish. We can talk to the weather. We can talk to sickness and disease. Do you remember where it said, and Jesus, oh, this was Peter's mother-in-law, he rebuked the fever. He rebuked the fever. He spoke to the fever. You can speak to fever. You can speak to cancers, tumors. You can, you can speak to inanimate objects. You can speak to demon spirits. Jesus did that. Everything you see Jesus did, you can do. He said, greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. He says, you can use my name. His name is where the power is, not your name. But you've been given authority to use his name. He said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Remember what he told Peter? He said, Peter, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, backed in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, backed in heaven. So the word of God is in your mouth full of power the way the system, the kingdom of heaven operates. So let's go on to um, the next point. The way God thinks and acts in heaven is the way we are th to think and act on earth. I know that's so strange uh, to most of us. Oh, I would never, I would never say or even imagine that I am to think and act like God. I mean, that would be heresy. No, it's Bible. Go over to Isaiah chapter 55 and let's look at verses 8 and 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but waters the earth, makes it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Now again, you couple that with Mark 11, 23 and 24, and you put the word of God in your mouth, and you speak that word, 
he said it's not going to return void. It's going to accomplish which he pleases. So the way that God thinks in heaven and the way God acts is the way we're supposed to think and act on the earth. We're his representative. We're his children. We're his sons and daughters. The problem is, as he says, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So he's in essence telling us, come up here. Start thinking bigger. Think like me. Oh, man, I know a lot of Christians will fall out at that. I can't think like God. Of course you can. If you've got his word and you get it renewed your mind, programmed to your spirit, you can think like God. You can talk like God. In, in Ephesians, it tells us to put on the whole armor of God. So if you're in God's armor and you keep the face plate down, <laughs> Satan don't know, but that's not God in there as long as you're speaking God's word and using the word uh, as a sword. Oral Roberts used to have a, a, a sign on his desk and it said, no small plans made here. I, I, I have seen this. I have experienced it. Uh, Brother Roberts would get bored with people that thought little, small, because he was a big thinker. He thought big thoughts, big things. Nothing is impossible to him that believeth. And if, and if you, you know, were with him, and he would ask you questions. I mean, he walked up to me one day and said, Abby, what would you rather have, justice or mercy? Well, I knew the right answer. I said, uh, mercy. He just turned around and walked off. He, he wanted to see what I would say. I had him uh, speak at one of our minister's conferences one year in Tulsa. I was the president of ICFM, International Convention of Faith Ministries, for 12 years, and we had our conferences once a year in Tulsa. And so I asked Brother Roberts if he would speak in one of the afternoon sessions to our ministers. He agreed. He came, walked in the hotel lobby, grabbed me by the uh, shoulder, and we went into their, to the conference room, and he spoke. And uh, I was taking notes. And when he was done, he turned it back over to me, and I got up and I said, Praise God, Brother Roberts, that was awesome. I learned so much. He got up off the first row, walked back up to the platform, stood next to me and said, tell me three things that you learned. <laughs> you did not say idly anything around him because he would question you. He would, he would interrogate you. He would say, what did you learn? And right there in front of all these, there were hundreds and thousands of, of ministers to attend these conferences. He walked up and he said, tell me three things that you learned right now. And I was so glad that I wasn't just making conversation. And I tell you what, I surprised myself. I looked at him and I said, I learned this, number one, number two, number three. He looked at me and smiled. He said, good for you. And he went and sat down. No small plans. He thought big. Well, go, go to Tulsa and look at Or Roberts University. I mean, and this thing was built in the 60s. It's a 21st century university with all the buildings and whatever. He built that thing and, and paid for it as he was building it. And then the City of Faith Hospital and other things that he was going to build. He was a big thinker. Well, God's telling us, come up, start thinking higher, start thinking. You know, the Bible says, he warns us about pride and arrogance and all that. He says, and of course, most people think, well, I, I, I need to think smaller of myself. I need to think less of myself. No, the Bible says to think properly of yourself. The Bible says not to think more highly of yourself. You are supposed to think highly of yourself. What does that mean? You're supposed to think about yourself the way God thinks about you. You're supposed to think about yourself the way the Bible says to think. None of this poor mouthing and false humility. You're supposed to think about yourself the way God thinks about you, but you're not supposed to think more highly of yourself. The Bible says for you to humble yourself. God's not going to humble you. You humble yourself. What we've mistakenly called 
well, God humbled me and put me through the ringer and did this and did that. No, no, no. What we did was we thought more highly of ourselves and we pushed ourselves over into the area of pride and haughtiness. And the Bible says pride and a haughty spirit goes before fall and before destruction. God didn't have a thing to do with that. I, I, I'm, I shudder sometimes. I, I'm, I'm amazed and amused at people that think that God's chastising them and God's uh, causing things to happen to humble them. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible says you humble yourself. And it's not God humbling you by putting you through the ringer or embarrassing circumstances. You put yourself there by allowing yourself to go into the realm of pride and a haughty spirit. And when you did, you reaped what you sowed. You fell, you were uh, destroyed or, or fallen from your position of authority. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says, to, God said, come up here and think, get in my realm. Start thinking like me. <laughs> well, how do you think like God? Well, you, you got his word right here. You know everything. I had a friend of mine that was listening to Peter J. Daniels. Peter J. Daniels spoke in our church several years ago. Peter J. Daniels, a multimillionaire, mints his own gold and silver. He lives in Adelaide, Australia. A very phenomenal man. I never met anybody like him. And he came to our church and uh, a friend of mine was listening to him and told his assistant, a minister friend of mine, uh, told his assistant, he said, I want you to go back and buy every tape that he has. The assistant came back and said, uh, are you sure you want me to buy every tape that he has, every CD? Yes. He said, it's going to cost $750 for everything that he has on his table. <laughs> and the minister said, so what? For $750, I can learn everything he knows. You can learn everything from God. You have the mind of Christ by getting into his word. Now, we'll pick up here tomorrow. Be sure and join me. Don't forget we're on Facebook, VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection. You can also find me on Twitter, happy underscore Caldwell. And this episode is available to watch online. So log on to VTNTV.com. Click on Watch On Demand. That's vtntv.com. Watch On Demand. You can order products, and VTN is available to watch 24-7 via live stream. Anywhere in the world, people can watch VTN all the way from central Arkansas. Isn't that amazing? Well, join me tomorrow, and don't forget, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas, and where you're watching. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at P.O. Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221. Or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com.